Hello, my name is Justin Caravulius. I'm the consignment director for Action Figures and Toys here at Heritage Auctions. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about some artwork that we have coming up as part of the Windy City Collection on November 20th. Um, you can go to ha.com 7389 to view the Windy City Collection. Um, everything will be going live up for bidding next week. Um, included in the auction are many pieces of original artwork from toy packaging and from trading cards. And among them are six pieces of incredible artwork from G.I. Joe uh, from the vintage uh, era uh, from 1964 through the Adventure Team. And uh, initially, I thought it would be you know just interesting to talk about these myself, but um, I decided to bring a couple of uh, a couple of people on to talk to uh, talk to you about it as well. Um, really, what I think are authorities within the GI Joe community. One of which, uh, you know, really has reached legendary status uh, within the GI Joe community. Um, so today, my guests are Kirk Bizigian and Carson Metaxas. Welcome. Thank oh, you for joining hi, Justin. Us. Hi, Justin. Thank you for having oh. us. So, uh, if, if you're watching this right now and you're a fan of GI Joe in general, you probably are familiar with both of them. Um, but I will give you a quick introduction. Uh, Kirk Bazigian worked for Hasbro from 1978 to 1996. He was the first, uh, and most of the time he was working on the GI Joe brand. He was the first um, original product manager for GI Joe, a real American hero. Um, and he worked on that line uh, for most of the time between 82 and 94. Um, he was also the vice president of Boys Toys during that time. Um, he's currently a marketing professor at Providence College, and he's the mastermind at HKB Ideas, where he does some consulting and comes up with ideas and, uh, you know, still touches the toy industry to this day. I know he also does conventions and, and continues to speak with people uh, like myself about G.I. Joe and, you know, the lasting impact it's had. Um, Carson is uh, an Emmy-winning editor and animator. He's a corrector. Uh, he's the creator of 3D Joe's. Um, which is a comprehensive catalog basically online of um, all of the Joes from a real American hero, including all the vehicles and you know, everything that touches. Um, they also have sister, uh, he has sister sites with that website called Vintage 3D Joes and 3D Super Joes, which basically cover the entire, you know, history of GI Joe. Um, it's, it's an incredibly great uh, you know, database of, of photos and history. Um, and Recently, he released a gigantic, the biggest book that I've personally ever owned and maybe ever held, um, 712 pages, omnibus hardcover of every piece of original art from Real American Hero, G.I. Joe, plus a little bit more into. Um, it's, it's really an impressive book. You can't imagine when you get it in the mail what this giant thing is. And it's as we discussed, it's not a coffee table book. It's actually a coffee table. So, and he will probably hold it up if he can. There you go. And, and, you, and, you, and you might get a hernia lifting it up. <laughs> I think it clocked I, in at 18, 18 pounds, was it? I tell, well, yeah, I tell it people close to, close to 20 pounds. Yeah. Lift with your legs. 3D Joe's is not responsible for hernias. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's, it's an amazing book. Everything is, uh, you know, printed, uh, oversized, incredibly clear. So I, I, I you know, as, as a fan of G.I. Joe, I can tell you that I appreciate having that in the world. And I Thank know a you, lot Justin. of us do too. Thank you. Um, so, and lastly, uh, Carson is working on uh, developing a new line of O-ring action figures um, called Operation Recall. He's working with some of the creators of that's, the that's original the director right there. Show, and Kirk is intimately involved with it. So, um, you know, these are these are two people who are involved in all aspects. And, and you know, Kirk has been doing this for, uh, you know. Of a very long time at the expert level. So we appreciate his continued involvement in, in this type of thing. So as you can probably tell, I am a GI Joe, you know, fan. So this is the, uh, you know, this is a, a, an opportunity for me to talk to some of the, you know, the people involved with it. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough, um, as I had already mentioned, that we're going to have, uh, you know, that I've had some GI Joe artwork that I've, you know, physically handled and looked at and inspected and am really excited about talking about. So, um, you know, today I'd just like to go through and talk about a little bit about that artwork, but also talk about the, the broader impact that uh, you know artwork has within action figures and specifically GI Joe. I really can't think of a different brand that has really relied on the artwork and that artwork at such an expert level um, where it's so important to it. And, and just Carson and I were talking about before that it, it, it's it just hasn't been duplicated or improved upon in you know in the many years um, you know going through from 
uh, you know, Petrucci to Stivers to Garrido um, and, and all those different areas that were, you know, they're really experts at what they did. So, um, you know, one of the things I, I'd like to start with is, you know, Kirk, what, what what is your, you worked on GI Joe, we talked a little bit about you know, starting in 1978 with Super Joe's, but what is your first memory of GI Joe in your, I guess your consciousness? <laughs> um, well, it goes way back. Uh, I, I can remember, I think I was 11 or 12 years old when the original uh, series of GI Joe first came out, the, the action soldier Marine uh pilot and sailor and uh i happened to be walking through a uh, uh a, a woolworth store in downtown providence um you know my mom would take us shopping every saturday and if we were good she'd reward us with something and uh i was walking through uh, a woolworth i was usually buying a model plastic model airplane or something and i walked around a, 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 an aisle and saw for the first time you know, boxes of uh, the shoebox, you know, what I call the shoebox style uh, G.I. Joe. And I was just blown away by it. I mean, I opened it up, uh, saw, you know, saw the uh, figures inside. Um, I, I said, I'm not getting a model airplane on this uh, shopping trip and uh, brought home uh, a G.I. Joe action soldier. Excellent. And I, I vividly remember that Woolworth had carrying the entire line of, uh, you know, accessories, uh, you know, outfits, weapons, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so that, that, that's my earliest memory of, of G.I. Joe. And, and who knew that I'd be, you know, managing the brand, you know, so many years later. So that was actually the next question I was going to ask you. So and, and I didn't know that beginning of the story. And I think that, you know, Carson and I probably have similar like, oh, man, G.I. You know, Joe came out when I was nine years old. So you can imagine mm -hmm. nine year, it's very impactful, I think, at that, you know, that age. Um, so you were, you know, you played with it as a kid and then you become the brand manager and you work at Hasbro before you were the brand manager. How did that come to pass? Was it, I'm going to get myself into Hasbro or it just worked out perfectly? How did that all happen? Uh, you know, it's, it's, again, that's, you know, you have dreams as a kid. And when I, when I, uh, uh, went to college, I knew I wanted to get into advertising. Uh, my goal was to be a, an advertising copywriter, work on Madison Avenue. Uh, you know, went and got a graduate degree in advertising, um, got out of school and at, at the height of what was, you know, a, a terrible uh, uh, recession um, and uh, never made it to Madison Avenue. But I did make it to uh, uh, Hasbro. I got a job as a copywriter in the uh, advertising department at Hasbro. Um, I was the one and only copywriter. I worked with all the different, you know, graphic designers, um, kind of honing my craft, um, you know, worked as a copywriter, writing all the packaging copy, all the instruction copy, um, all sales promotions, catalogs, et cetera. Um, never got to write what I had been trained to do, which was television commercials. Um, but I quickly discovered that, um, the heart of business, at least at Hasbro, the, the heart of business was the marketing department and uh, found my way into the marketing department thanks to a friendship I struck up with um, Bob Prupus, who was at that time the marketing director for Boys and Girls Toys. And my first job was working on girls toys, believe it or not. Um, and uh, Bob had a vision of bringing back G.I. Joe and he and I would talk about it all the time and, and how we could do it, different ways of doing it. Um, and eventually, after like two years of working on it, um, we were able to convince our management team that the time for reintroducing G.I. Joe was now. And so that's um, the short story of how I, I, I worked on G.I. Joe and helped get a real American hero version introduced into the marketplace. Excellent. That's that's a, it's it's always amazing to see you know when someone comes from enjoying you know and loving GI Joe and, and and ending up being you know the the, the person in charge of it that is a uh, you know that's, I can't think of really a better story. Um, that's what well, you want. The dream it was the dream of every fanboy, right? So right, that right. that's I guess I lived the adventure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you <laughs> there you go. Um, so you know you worked with the copy and you worked with. Uh, I'm sure you worked with uh, some of the artists. You, you were, you know, in the same building with some of these people. Um, at, at what point did you, you know, are, are 
point today is to talk a little bit about the artwork. Mm -hmm. um, at, at what point do you realize how important the artwork is to G.I. Joe and how inter I mean, you, you're walking into that store at, at 11 years old. You didn't see an action figure. That wasn't what you saw. Unless there maybe there was a, a you know some type of advertising that showed it, but you saw the coffin box photo right on the front, you know the the Petrucci photo right on the or, or image on the front. Yep. I well, mean, and that, is that what sold you? I mean, is uh, that you, you, I, you know? I, I guess. I mean, uh, th there was such a power in, in in those illustrations, those four illustrations. They were so powerful um, that I guess that just attracted. You know, just attracted your attention uh, as a as a young young boy. Um, you know, again, when you know, one of the things um, that I I learned in, in in advertising is is the the connection between words and 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 graphics or words and artwork. Um, uh, when I was learning advertising, I, you know, part of a copywriter's job is to uh, envision. You don't just write the words. I mean, the, the idea behind an advertising copywriter is uh, you, you come up with the concept of the ad and that means you come up with the visuals as well as the words and you probably help uh, initially direct the art director uh, for what your vision is. Uh, luckily I happen to be a, a little bit of an artist and I was able to use my artistic background to convey to some of the artists those things the, uh, the way we wanted things to look. Um, and so, you know, I, I used that background in, that I had in advertising uh, to fashion, you know, what I would do later on in, in terms of G.I. Joe. Great. So I want to move over to, you know, to Carson and, you know, kind of take it from there. So, you know, as you went into, uh, you know, Real American Hero and, start, and, and began that, obviously, you know, the artwork was a huge part of that. I know as a, you know, as a, as a kid, when I looked at those packages, mm -hmm. the, you saw the artwork, the artwork told you what that figure, the figure was just standing there. He was fairly static, but that artwork told you how he was going to move, what he was going to do. It was him in action. His face had a personality. Yeah. Uh, Carson, what is that? You know, I want you to take it from there. What would, what, what are the artwork, you know, so the number one takeaway for me uh, when I was interviewing uh, Ed Morrill, who was a contractor who worked with Hasbro from 1969 to 1989, he was a packaging executive, a branding executive that did logo design, package design, and hired and managed the illustrators and worked closely with uh, Bob Krupas and Kirk Bazigian to get a real American hero off the ground in 1981. Obviously, it launched in 82. But he was also uh, a key figure in helping rebrand G.I. Joe from a military toy line in 64 to 69 to that adventure team relaunch in 1970. And the thing that Ed Morrill said was he never, it's not that he didn't care about any one specific product. Every product had to stand alone and be a great package, but he cared about unity across the line. He cared about that experience when you walked into the toy aisle and you saw all these products together. How do they work together to create you know, that, that wow factor that would make you stop at that section of the aisle, not at the section of the aisle that had Star Wars or whatever the competitors were at that time. So he was really much about uh, brand unity, about unifying the packages, be it a, a large playset or be it a small accessory pack. They all had to have similar key components that gave you that cohesive uh, uh, unifying look. And obviously, you know, beyond the logo and the black background and the explosion, speaking of a real American hero right now. In addition to that, you had to have the perfect artist that would create a visual style that was similar across all the packaging. And so they had that with Hector Garrido and that's that's where I came in as a fanboy. So, so when I started walking down the aisles in the early 80s, early to mid 80s, uh, I was blown away by Hector Garrido's art and it really overcame a lot of the shortcomings or challenges that they had in manufacturing realistic figures at that time. So if you look at like 1982 Scarlet, she's not a beautiful figure. And that's by the nature of the two piece mold and how they had to do her hair. And so it just wasn't a super attractive woman. I think by 1984, when they made the Baroness with the separate hair and the, the glasses and everything, they really started to hit their rhythm with the ladies. But the packaging art saved that figure. Because right. every time you played with that toy, at least in my mind's eye, mm -hmm. I would be playing with the woman that was re represented by Hector Garrido in that painting, right? So the painting had a really vital role 
of showing you what these figures or vehicles will look like in the real world and to help you bridge that gap between what this plastic thing actually looked like and what that thing would look like in the real world. So the, the visual language of the packaging was, you know, absolutely invaluable. And one of the things that things that Kirk has talked to me about was the fact that they were competing with Star Wars, which had a multi-million dollar feature film times three, right? That was hugely successful to help propel their brand and get kids into stores wanting to buy that. G.I. Joe didn't have that. When, when they started A Real American Hero, they didn't have the comic book yet. They didn't have the cartoon yet. Uh, they didn't have any feature films, certainly. And so the number one thing they had to tell the story of A Real American Hero was the art on the front. And if that sucked you in, you would turn it over and you'd see the cross cell on the back so you could see the whole world of characters. And you could read Larry Hama's file card that was edited by Kirk. And you could read about you know the story of this world. So the packaging was the only marketing tool they had to tell the story of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, early on. So invaluable. Excellent. And so jumping back to kind of that first you know question I asked Kirk, what was you, what's your first memory? You know, a lot of people know their first. Fi- Do you have a first memory or just your first figures you had? Yeah. So you know, interestingly, my dad was an army guy. And uh, I started, I got hooked on G.I. Joe because of the cartoon, which I think what was really brilliant about A Real American Hero, you had the cartoon to suck in the young kids. You had the comic book to carry us through like that eight to teenager years because it was written a little more mature and it challenged you intellectually. Um, But the figures were like the glue that held it all together. So I saw the cartoon and that was the first thing that sucked me in. And I think I begged my mom to buy me G.I. Joe's from about 1984 to 1986. So she finally caved in in 1986 and bought me Dial Tone. So he was my he was my first. I was playing at my friend Brian Gatica's house in the sandbox, <laughs> literally with his toys, and he had some GI Joes. And I remember he had the flak and he had the howl and he had the vamp, and I had none of this. And I was just begging my mom, buy me GI Joe, buy me GI Joe. And I don't know if she didn't want me to be an army guy or something, so she just refused for a couple of years. But I didn't give up, and she finally broke down. So uh, her and my brother stopped at the store and bought me my first carded figure on the way to pick me up from Brian's, and they picked me up and they had dial tone ready for me so i was like you know at the same time i was a little disappointed that it wasn't like beachhead or bats there were some great figures in 86 yeah, yeah. Uh, so i got dial tone but i made up for that i collected them all once you break the ice i'm sure you were oh that damn that ice. damn was broken we were the household was flooded with gi joe's after that <laughs> that that's a great story carson <laughs> thanks kirk i appreciate it you never give up on your dreams kids <laughs> nope uh, for two years of wanting gi joe's i i, I want to go yeah. back in time and buy you GI, like if, if I saw a kid, and I'm sure we'd all feel this way, if we saw a kid who was desperately wanted G.I. Joes today, I mean, I, I would just, yep. I would shower them. Throw with all the Joes out of them. Please, yep. please take as many as you want and do what you need to do with them. Yep. So, well, yeah. Well, Carson's experience reminds me of a famous quote that Bob Proopus once told me when we were trying to reintroduce G.I. Joe because we kept getting told no, no, no by Stephen Hassenfeld at the time, the CEO of Hasbro. And Bob would, at at the end of every meeting, he'd say to me, you know, no just means maybe. Right. And, <laughs> and that, was, that was Bob's attitude. He never took no for an answer. So no yeah. just meant maybe. So that's why we just kept pursuing it. So Carson obviously did the same thing. Every time his mom said, no, 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 he kept saying, <laughs> nah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Right? That's a maybe, That's mom. a great story. Thank you. You know, it's funny, Kirk, we opened the book with pictures of kids opening their toys. And so I went through all of my family's old photo albums. The only toy photos I could find was me opening Megatron, which was a Walther P-38 transforming robot. I'm like, you won't buy me war toys, yeah. but you'll buy me a Walther <laughs> P-38. Yeah. How does that, how does that make sense? So anyway, that was pretty funny. That's great. So, you know, I could, we could probably sit here and talk all day about all the different things, but you know, one of the things I, the, the main thing that I want to talk about today is, you know, I, like I said, I have the privilege of handling some of this incredible art. Uh, my first G.I. Joe, you know, A Real American Hero came out when I was nine, but my first G.I. Joe I ever had was an adventure team uh, land adventurer that my mother got at a yard sale. It was, I didn't get the box. I didn't see the package, but I remember, you know, screwing the feet off and the elbows and, you know, the hit and, and the, the missing chunks of hair. And, you know, I don't <laughs> think I had any accessories, but it, it, that's my earliest memory of having a GI Joe. Um, so even though I didn't have any of the packaging, that era is very, you know, it, it, it 
definitely I have strong feelings about looking at some of this artwork and, and and it's you know has an impression on me even you know seeing it as an adult and now actually holding some of these these things it's just in, incredible artwork so um, what I'd like to do is you know go, go through the pieces that we have here and you know give them a give them a quick you know discussion about you know and I'll share some of the things that I'm able to see in person that you know might not stand out first of all so um, the first one we're going to look at is the uh, GI Joe Adventure Team chest winch. Um, it is a Don Stivers piece of art from 1975. Um, and this is the, you'll notice the, from the orange background, there were two different backgrounds. The earlier card was on a blue background. And this one is on the orange background. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I'll tell you a little something about this in a second. But, you know, does, is there anything specific, you know, about this piece that, uh, you know, that stands out? Well, I mean, this was the era of the non-military uh, G.I. Joe. This was the era of how can we make Joe exciting? Um, I remember talking to a few of the designers who, who worked, who's still at Hasbro, uh, who was still at Hasbro um, many years later, who said, wow, you know, that was such a crazy time because we were virtually asked to make boring things exciting. And so... <laughs> You know, here's, here's a classic example of, you know, an accessory pack that um, a Joe figure would wear that would hoist things up in the air. Um, truly exciting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've actually run a steady cam rig uh, that, that uh, that's what this takes my mind to, where you have to belt the thing on around your waist and you got these huge things over your shoulders and then you got these pipes that come out and then you got this camera suspended in front of you. And let me tell you, it's not super comfortable. <laughs> and uh, I look at this accessory and I'm like, oh, man, his lower back's going to be hurting at the end of the day, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. but uh, I, I look at this and go, you know, first of all, you know, I, I when, when you start to write about these things, because I've described mm -hmm. these, you start to really think about what's going on here. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something that you throw in your backpack and walk around and you end up on a cliff somewhere. This is something that needs to be transported there. So chances are it was some type of vehicle. Now, you could always attach a winch to that vehicle. I know it wouldn't be that much fun, you know, and, and, and you know, you, you look at this nice little very thin hill that, you know, certainly can support his weight and not, not break, you know, it, it gets, it gets a little bit sillier as, you know, but as a, as a piece for a, a kid to have, you strap this over your figure, you lift things up and down. It's a great toy, but as a, you know, practicality, it seems a little bit silly. You know, from an artistic perspective, uh, it really makes me wonder if they completely re repainted this product, right? So the original blue one came out in 1972, and then the uh, the orange background uh, came out in 1975. Uh, according to my friend that built Vintage 3D Joes, the, the 1975 one is rare, probably because it was made in lower quantities than the 1972 one, and we were... We were reaching the end of the line. The line ended in 1976, so this was released in 75 on the orange card. So it's probably sold in much shorter quantities. But the first thing I think about, you know, because, you know, as we know, Hasbro was prone to allow artists or to encourage artists to paint over old paintings to make new paintings because it was quicker. Um, it, it just makes me wonder if this is the only piece that exists. Was this painted over the blue one? That, that's where my mind goes. Because you would cut a stencil around the figure and the accessory itself, and then you would just repaint that whole background. Now, interestingly, they did change uh, the object that he's picking up. In the blue card, it's a square object. On the orange card, it's a, it's a tree trunk or whatever. So that's, that's the number one thing. That's observation, Carson. Thank you. Well, I, can, I can give you a, a little piece of information is mm -hmm. that this, the figure is trimmed out. So that figure... The, mm -hmm. the the image of the uh, mm -hmm. of the adventurer there with the winch is cut all the way around and trimmed exactly to the edges. Mm -hmm. The background is repaint is a painted a new piece and then he's glued on, and some Got of it. the grass around his feet they touched up so that there's not just the background but there are and it's it's really tough to see here but mm -hmm. some of the you know they they touched it so that it would look like the grass I think probably right around his feet. Was yeah. coming over his feet mm -hmm. instead of being, uh, you know, showing the cuts. But yeah, I, I tend to believe that that is the same original image mm -hmm. that they trimmed out and pasted onto a new background. So this, so is, Kirk, this is this is the analog version of Photoshop. 
Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yes. So we should make it <laughs> we should make it clear to the audience. Photoshop did not come around until the late eighties. And uh, you know, Ed Morrill, the packaging guy I was talking to, said they, they were on the cutting edge of using Adobe, and that was still not really used until the very late eighties. So everything you're looking at here would absolutely be analog. And what they would do, they actually did this with transformers a lot because a lot of the transformers art was made in Japan. And then when Hasbro licensed it here, they would make photostat prints and then they would paint over it. They would airbrush over it. So this is probably a photostat print of the original product cut out uh, and pasted on a new background and then painted over to make it, you know, look more seamless. Excellent. Um, cool. I wasn't sure if I was going to bring anything of value because I'm more of a real American hero guy. Right, but yeah, right. this is good. Excellent. <laughs> So the you next one, the A game, Carson. You brought yeah. the A game. I appreciate it. Now, co commenting on artwork is, a, you know, as a as a critic of the artwork and being able to appreciate it. You know, every every opinion is is valued. So it's it's good Thanks. stuff. The um the next one we have up is the Dangerous Mission GI Joe Adventure Team. Uh, another Don Stivers uh, painting from 1973. Um, you know, as I described this, I try. You know, th this is a this is very much a you have no idea what mission he's on. All you can do is surmise from this photo is that he is on a tropical location. He's got a red background with a lot of shading. So it's either first thing in the morning, or I prefer to think it's more of a sunset at night where mm -hmm. uh, the sun is going down either over mountains or those could be clouds, but it's obviously a tropical setting. Other than that, it's left up completely to the imagination, but the, you know, the, the much like a lot of Don Stiver's, uh, paintings, the expression on the face is hugely important. It's got a lot of concentration, a lot of character. Um, you know, the, the eyes look alive. Um, so th those are just some of the observations that I, I look at there. This was also used on a couple of different packages. What's the product name for this one? Um, this was the uh, Dangerous Mission. Got it. Yeah, this this is really a dramatic piece of art. I mean, you know, you can read a lot into it. Um, and I, I think you hit on it, Justin, you know, it, you can imagine it being a mission, you know, at dusk or early morning, you know, uh, and, and this has a lot of action and excitement to me. Uh, and this harkens back to more of the, to me anyway, the classic, uh, you know, G.I. Joe military. This, this is where the, they're trying to walk a fine line between adventure and military. Yeah. Right. I, I, I definitely would agree with that. He's he, You're not sneaking up with a sniper rifle at dusk uh, doing something peaceful, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, Justin, if you scroll down to the bottom, what I find interesting is the, the sun is setting behind him. You see the color hitting the waves, which creates that nice little rim lighting on his arm. But then as you go down, you notice there's a bigger light source that's in front of him. So he's right. approaching some kind of installation that has a bunch of light coming off of it that's hitting the front of his leg and hitting the front side of that mountain, whereas the sun is behind him. So in my mind, this is dusk, and he's sneaking up on a building that's already illuminated. Right. Uh, that's just the story that comes to mind in my head. Uh, but yeah, yeah this I didn't, the, even, I didn't even notice that part of it, but all of a sudden it just opens up a whole, you know, what's before him type of yeah. scenario. He's right. about to he's about to attack somebody that's in that installation, and they probably don't know that he's coming. Um, so this was first issued in 1973, and then again in 1974. I believe it was a an action outfit in '73, and uh, like in a box, in a recessed box, and then it was more of a blister pack in 1974. Correct. But yeah. uh, you know, Ooh, kudos yeah. to my friend Matthew McKeeby who built out vintage 3d Joe's. If you want to see any of these products in the various iterations, just, you know, type out the name of the product and, uh, and go visit it at 3d Joe's and you'll see the packaging. So. And, and these packaging artwork that we've included on these, mm -hmm. uh, of the original packaging is courtesy of, um, of the website as well. So we, yep. we appreciate yep. that. So thank you to Ace Allgood uh, for sharing that. Matthew McKeeby did a tremendous amount of work building that site out. So. Great. This also, you know, kind of as I look at it, you know, and think about it, I know it's it's a few years after, but um, it also is kind of reminiscent of a James Bond uh, adventure. You know, if you, if you look at it this way, that you know, Bond in the Doctor No movie, um, you know, kind of invades Doctor No's lair, mm -hmm. um, 
from the ocean, you know, with the tropical uh, palm trees in the background, that kind of thing. So I, I see a real story here being told with this artwork. And, and I also look at it, you know, another thing that you notice is the only thing that he has that's visible here is, is a sniper rifle. Mm -hmm. He's not all geared up. He's doesn't right. have, you know, he, he's, it's, he's not a Navy SEAL with every accessory mm -hmm. that he, he's just a guy with a gun. And mm -hmm. uh, it has that sim that simplicity. You know, obviously that's all they were selling in the package. So it makes sense that that's all they would put on him. But also from the, from the artwork, it's just a, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, he's, He's as prepared as he needs to be, but he's yeah. not completely geared up. So you wonder, you know, where is he coming from? He doesn't have a canteen. I don't even see a belt on him. He's yeah. just on a very quick, very short mission to, you know, probably a, a, a single objective and and move on from there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would like to think that he approached the island on a raft because he's not wet. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, whatever supplies are probably still back in the raft. And this is a quick uh, hit and get out of there type situation uh it is worth noting all of the uh outfits that were sold using this packaging are are all that kind of olive drab military look but there's no military kind of branding on them at all right so that, again they're they're doing that they're striking that balance of you know you got to keep in mind this was after vietnam war fatigue and the reason they moved towards the adventure team was because of the the war fatigue we had america had been through a really a really tough you know several years in vietnam and so they wanted these toys to be adventurous and fun, but not necessarily to communicate. These are army guys, Marine guys, Navy guys, you know, going out and fighting the enemy. All right. Excellent. So the, the next one we're going to move on to is, uh, is a, a very cool one. The sea adventure <clears throat> with the introduction of the Kung Fu grip. Nice. And uh, there is, you know, not, Kung Fu grip has now exceeded the world of GI Joe. I'm sure Many, many people have heard the term Kung Fu Grip and don't know where it comes from. It's just one of those terms that, that jumps out. And, and uh, <clears throat> when you look at this, there is the Kung Fu Grip couldn't be more <laughs> in the center of this photo. <laughs> and as you look at, you know, as, as someone who you know played with the original hands on the G.I. Joe and, you know, going to the Kung Fu Grip, you, you almost have a hard time imagining, like, what were they what, what were we supposed to do with those first hands? And the Kung Fu Grip was really a game changer because it really allowed you, you know, as, as, as someone who played with, with toys, every, you know, a, a toy that grips is, you know, a huge advancement. And G.I. Joe had all this great articulation, but, you know, the hands were, you know, were probably one of the weakest spots. You had to really just cradle things. Um, so the Kung Fu Grip, you know, this was the, you know, they had the action diver first, and now they've rebranded that concept to the sea adventurer um, with the introduction of the Kung Fu grip. And again, you know, the, the, the artwork on this, again, done by, done by Don Stivers in 1973, is just amazing with the shadowing. I mean, those hands look very real. The expression and the weathering on the face looks, you know, very real. So what are you, what are, you know, happy it's to beautiful, hear it's beautiful like seeing it high resolution like that. Yeah. Just beautiful. Um, this was also an era where, you know, G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe was trying to, um, the marketing and R&D team in, on working on the brand at this time, they were really trying to ha very hard to salvage the brand and sa salvage sales. Um, and so for many years, G.I. Joe had, had really done nothing to, to, uh, to the figure, nothing to the marketing um, until this, well, Actually, right before this was the introduction of lifelike hair, which is what you know this figure has, both the you know the fuzzy hair and the and the beard. Um, but I believe at this time, you know, they were trying to make these kind of you know toyetic uh, improvements to the figure, and so this idea of the kung fu grip was one of the first um, that actually added some additional play value, like you pointed out, Justin. Um, the other thing is, if I'm not mistaken, um, and this was an opportunity to uh, ride on the coattails of a very popular TV show at the time, which was Kung Fu. Um, mm. And, and you know, they didn't have to pay a royalty uh, because they weren't using, was it David Carradine? David I think Carradine. Was, right. He was the star of it. Yeah. Um, I, I would have to check my dates, but I think it was around this time. And... Um, so this was this was you know a good example of Hasbro's marketing team you know taking advantage of something that's out in the pop culture 
area and incorporating that expression kung fu into uh the gi joe brand which made natural you know perfect sense i mean you know every uh soldier is somewhat trained in martial arts and certainly gi joe would have been uh trained and so would this adventure team member uh so i just think it's a perfect example of of you know unique marketing and r&d working together uh, uh, along with the, the the artwork that really captures the story Kirk, that is a brilliant insight. Uh, this is why I love talking through stuff with you, the, the little tidbits <laughs> that, that you, you piece the dots together. So uh, Kung Fu, uh, it aired for that three seasons. It comes from being old, Carson, and having a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff up here. You a know? lot of memories to draw from, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Kung Fu with David Carradine uh, started in 1972, aired for three seasons, was very popular. This figure premiered one year later, 1973. So Kung Fu was on TV when they were developing this product, and it's, it probably certainly was front of mind. So brilliant connection there. Um, Justin, I wanted to ask you, uh, go back to the close-up for me and go in close to the rifle and the head. What I'm noticing there is what I would call a drop shadow, right? Like some dimensionality between where the figure is and where the background is. Is this a uh, cutout dimensional figure again, or is it painted that way with the drop shadow? It's actually painted that way. And if you okay. if if we oh, move wow. down a little bit lower, mm -hmm. you'll see that there's actually a cut. Yeah, the diagonal there. It's, yeah, the diagonal. It's actually the lower part that is that is added, not the upper oh, part. Interesting. And I I couldn't specifically tell you anything why? noticeable why. Yeah, especially but, if it was if it was prepared purely for those two coffin boxes. I'm seeing two coffin boxes. On vintage 3d joe's i don't know why they would have to add to it because the coffin box uh shows the entirety of his left hand and then shows the steering wheel i'm not sure yeah that that cut is not visible on the packaging as it was reproduced so that's that's interesting i'm not sure how or why yeah i i it, there was nothing obvious about that i saw that would mm -hmm. be the case but isn't it amazing the the hand gesture there like i, I wonder if he used photo reference for that it's like it's a, it's a crazy, crazy pose. Really good foreshortening. Like the hands look proportionately very big for mm -hmm. the figure. So they really would have to be out front like this. You know, it's but a beautiful look, piece of art. Yeah. And, and if you look at it, you know, like we analyzed the last ones, you know, as I thought about this one, you know, he's, he, again, he's not all geared up. He's, there's nothing showing behind him. So it's a strangely small boat with a, you know, with, a with large a, wheel. wheel. But he's also got the gun strapped to his back. So he's on a short, he either just left somewhere, he's just arriving, or he's on a short trip from one place to another. It doesn't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, how many ships would have a wheel like that where you would see this much in the background. But it, you know, again, it told a story, just having the gun on his back told a little bit of the story from whatever perspective, you know, your imagination would take you. Well, it's great seeing the uh, it's great seeing the wide angle view of the artwork because what we received on the package was cropped mm -hmm. very much more than what we're seeing here, so it's cool and to that, see that. That, that kind of you see it on a few different pieces of artwork that it seemed that they knew the direction that they wanted to take the packaging, but weren't quite sure exactly where the cuts would be. So some of the things are oversized and some of the things are a little strange um we'll get in a couple of we'll, we'll get to the uh you know the final piece and that one is a, a little bit different of a shape than you would final than you would you know a little they, they went a little further with it than, than mm -hmm. needed to be for the box but yep. um with that we'll jump to the next one which is the recovery of the lost mummy adventure uh the final of our don stivers artwork this was oh i'm sorry missile recovery we'll jump <laughs> i jumped ahead sorry missile recovery okay. Uh, I hate, hate to miss this one. Uh, this is also a really cool one. This is Missile Recovery from uh, Don Stivers, 1972. Um, and this one is great because it's an underwater scene. Um, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of action going on here. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it was, a, you know, it was a couple of small pieces with a diving suit. And this really informs you about a whole lot more that you could do with it. Um, you know, the missile being just the, the head of the you know, the, the important part of the missile or not really sure what part of the missile that would be that you'd need they, to recover. They call it on, they call it a uh, nose cone is what they call it on the package. So the package says they, it has a scuba jacket, short pants, face mask, fins, nose cone, and missile detector. So it was a non-exploding missile. 
I would assume. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting short mission. And and the interesting thing about this, not a lot of the uh, the top have survived because it was kind of what like a neoprene type of foamy mm. plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know if it was more like rubber or it was, it was rubber. Like, most rubber. likely, it was okay. rubber, and the rubber decays. Mm. Um, so this this again, I think you know, what year was this? Do you, you did you say uh, this is nineteen seventy two? Yeah, seventy two. So. Again, I look at this and, and, and I hearken back to uh, James Bond. I mean, it was there was definitely in talking to a number of the older uh, R and D people at Hasbro, uh, the marketing people were all gone by the time I got there. Um, but uh, the, the R and D people that were still there, I mean, they, they drew a lot of inspiration from James Bond movies, and so this to me reminds me very much of uh, Thunderball. Uh, even down to the colorations of the um, the wetsuit and the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Bond wore an orange uh, wetsuit in in Thunderball, and um, and so the, this kind of coloration and just the whole idea of uh, this adventure is probably something that you know the somebody in R&D took inspiration from that from the James Bond movie. Um, so. You know, th this is, again, one of those more exciting pieces of illustration for, in actuality, what was a pretty boring toy. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think it's worth noting, Justin, uh, this is the second version of the painting that has been retouched or repainted to add all of that orange that you see in the water there above him. So if you mm -hmm. look at the original 1972 release, uh, there's none of that uh, orange color palette in the water behind him the the figure itself you know remains you know dressed in yellow and orange none of that changed but yep. the background did change and i think that was to coincide with the rest of the packaging because the original 1982 packaging was a very light blue kind of carolina blue box uh with the adventure team logo uh the circle with the a and the t in it yep. and then the uh this was re-released in 1975 with the orange border packaging with that kind of psychedelic gi joe logo you know, with the with the stream of oranges and yellows going oh, yeah. behind it, uh, yeah. So they uh, clearly they revised this package artwork for the nineteen eighty excuse me nineteen seventy five release. Yeah, and the other thing, if you go back and look at the history of of the GI Joe brand at this time, um, they were the, the sometimes the innovation each year uh, was simply the change of packaging. The, the, the look of the package, uh, the coloration of the package. Um, it, it was, you know, a way for the Hasbro marketing and sales team to talk to their toy buyers about, we really don't have anything new to show you in terms of G.I. Joe, uh, but we do have a new package. And, you know, from a marketing perspective, sometimes that works, and it certainly carried the line for a couple of years. But... Um, in, in the world of toys, it, it catches up to you sooner or later that you're not adding much to the brand. And and that's what G.I. Joe was suffering at the, at the time. I did a whole extensive analysis of um, the G.I. Joe brand at this time. Um, uh, and I, I was I published things on LinkedIn, uh, a series of articles on LinkedIn, because um, uh, 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 what was it the uh, not the, the toys that made us the toys that built America. Uh, did a uh, show on G.I. Joe, and they got a, a number of things right, but they also got a few things wrong, and I tried to correct and clarify some of the things that they got wrong um, in, in a series of posts. And one of the things that it caused me to do was to take a look at the G.I. Joe brand at this time, this, this time frame. And G.I. Joe was suffering not just from the, the, the lack of um, interest in the brand, um, because other figures or other concepts were getting uh, more and more exciting, not just because of the common excuses that the Vietnam War affected G.I. Joe sales. The other common uh, urban myth, as far as I'm concerned, is that the OPEC oil embargo had such a dramatic impact on plastic that it affected the sales of G.I. Joe. To me, none of that is, is the real answer. The real answer is that the company itself took its eye off the ball. Uh, G.I. Joe was a cash cow. Uh, it, it was treated like a cash cow. Um, the, it could, the comp, Hasbro could count on steady sales year in, year out. And so 
Uh, we didn't have to invest in, in creating new toys every year. We could take a year off. We could take two years off. You know, do what, what baseball teams do and what football teams do, and they call it a bridge year, you know. Uh, and that bridge year can sometimes cause, you know, a lot of uh, problems for your organization. And, and that's what really happened here. And so uh, the way to get around the fact that you didn't invest the, the money needed in R&D to create a new toy or to create a new mechanism or whatever was simply, well, let's change the package. That'll give it a new, exciting look at store level. Uh, and so that, that's what I think, you know, is happening here. Um, so the, the, these packages, as Carson's correct, uh, you know, because we did it ourselves you know, with uh, the 82 uh, versions. We would get art and we would paint over the art, um, keep the basic figure, but change the colorations of the figures and change the, you know, change the uh, background of the figures, um, to, you know, because we were changing uh, over time. And eventually that caught up with us as well. You know, you've got when you've got a brand like a G.I. Joe brand that you're you've invested in and you've created out of whole cloth, you have to keep reinvesting in it. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that's just a simple my little treatise on G.I. Joe packaging at this time. Yeah. No, I, I love it. We we actually we absolutely saw that in a real American hero as early as year two. You know, you got the uh, silver pads, Grand Slam. You got Tan Grunt with the Falcon Glider. You got the Viper Pilot with the with the Viper uh, Glider. So yeah, as early as year two, they were already repurposing and re-releasing the same, selling us the same stuff again, right? With with minor changes. Right. So that, that's just part of the industry. You have to recover your investments in the molds. And but I think to Kirk's point maybe Hasbro was recovering a little too much profit from the molds <laughs> and they should have been in investing in some new molds and some new toys uh, in the mid seventies around this period. Well, they, they certainly reinvented it. You know, there's, there's, there's been reinventions over the years, you know, the, the super Joe's, I, I know I've talked a little bit with, with Kirk about that, that, you know, they only lasted a couple of years, but man, those were some fantastic toys from, from a kid at that time who played with them? I, nice. I I pity children who did not have the pleasure of playing with Super Joes and the you know the the, the battery accessories and the lights and the yeah, helicopters. Those, and the they, those they were, were toys. Those were toys that were ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. They really were. They were. They came at a time when the, the the excitement of the brand had been was waning, and this was like a last ditch effort. And had that had those ideas come in a couple of years earlier mm -hmm. to the twelve inch line, mm -hmm. we might have had a whole different history. Right. It was, but they even for those two years that they existed, they, that was a that was an incredible incredible line, uh, and I, I was you know I'm I'm happy to have have experienced that when I was younger. Um, so we're going to jump to the next one. Uh, I jumped the gun a little bit earlier, but um, it's the recovery of the lost mummy adventure, um, mm -hmm. the last of the Don Stivers. Uh, this was a Sears exclusive in 1972. I find it very you know very cool. I, I actually talked to somebody at Sears who was a buyer for some of these things in the in the 70s and, you know, having dealt with Star Wars. And I, I we talked about that pretty extensively, but probably G.I. Joe and, you know, Sears at that time had a lot of pull. It's probably the Walmart of its of its day, you know, and they, they could de you know determine what some of the things would get uh, it would get to market. And this is a perfect example of artwork that was for a Sears exclusive. Um, which is just amazing. This is, uh, if, of, of all the artwork, if I, you know, was going to take one home, this would probably be the one. Uh, this has a lot going on. Um, so what, what are your impressions? Well, th this really does tell a story. I mean, this is, um, and I'm going to assume that you got all of this in one set. I think everything but the adventurers, right? Everything but the figures. Yeah, everything right. but the figures. So it was like the helicopter, the, the raft, and the mm -hmm. ATV. Um, and, and, and the mummy, and the mummy, yeah, like sarcophagus, yeah, so the, yep. the tools. Yep. Yeah. The outfit and the hat. It's a tremendous amount. Of, they, he's got a shovel. He's got a pickaxe. He's got a maybe like a little, uh, I don't know, a case. He's got maybe a net or something that comes with a machete, a machete uh, sheath. Like it, it's a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah, this this was like the ultimate complete toy for Christmas, you know, at this yeah. time. And, and these were small things. things. These were, you know, th these were large vehicles. Oh, yeah. I mean, that helicopter is huge. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I did enjoy as I, you know, analyzed the the artwork and the scene that was going on. You know, they gave you the raft, so they've got to put the oasis in there. You know, right <laughs> with the background, yeah. right in between the uh, the pyramids and uh -huh. the very you, you couldn't go far with that with, with that raft. You kind of just floated around the <laughs> oasis, right? <laughs> it's about 12 yards uh, yeah. there must have been something in the middle of that oasis that they couldn't walk around to the other side and they needed to yeah. be from the center of it that's hilarious um, you know, and, you know and, so yeah joe struggled with that with their uh diorama photos so like early on they would do these diorama photos that showed all that year's products all together but you'd have like a polar battle bear next to a tank next to a whatever <laughs> and and so you'd have like a little frosted corner of the diorama where yeah. the polar battle bear and snow job would be but then you would have like the desert scene it, it was fun uh so yeah they basically had to do that in a piece of artwork um, the one thing that strikes me about this piece is uh, one of the things Ed Morrill told me is that every Adventure Team illustration created by Don Stivers looked like Don Stivers. Uh, so he he used himself as reference. And so a lot of these guys, these these bearded guys, they, they look like Don Stivers. So it's almost like you got two Don Stivers in the same image, which is <laughs> fun to me. Yeah, that's that's good. That's cool. And, and I mean, the other thing that you that I see here, the thing that stands out when you look at the whole image, it's moving. This is oh, a yes. very active, active. You see the tension. You see him mm -hmm. pulling it away. You see, mm -hmm. you, know, you see those blades moving. You can almost feel the activity going. You, you know, the, the wind and the, you know, that, it's it's, yeah. it's incredibly active. Probably the most active of of any of the images so far, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because of that tension and the and the helicopter there, it's uh, yeah. you know, it, 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 it's a strong feeling for me when I look at this, and it, it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely, it's, absolutely. That's a fun piece. It's a it's a complete story in one illustration, and it's a good size too. It's uh, you know, it's it's a full wall size. You know, yeah, I can imagine because I can imagine the box that that toy came in. Mm. Yep. And then uh, we're going to get to the last piece here which is a San Petrucci piece from 1964. It is Boom. the original box mm -hmm. art for the 1964 Sailor. Actually, yep. as far mm -hmm. as I know, um, in, in the world of, uh, you know, whether mm -hmm. these things exist, this very well may be the only one that still exists to this day. It's the only one that I know of. And uh, I believe, Carson, we had talked a little bit about this and you got some uh some some inf information about this possibly before yeah we... very very excited to share this uh um, okay so you know interestingly um kirk you've I, maybe you've watched the blue rays by now but there was one interview that i did with doug where we sat down and went through the entire soft cover collecting the art of gi joe series and we got to this set of figures that you guys re-released in 1994 right which recreated the original 12 inch figures in three and three quarter inch scale mm -hmm. and uh one of the things that doug told me was i painted those i was like wait you painted those i thought those were painted by petrucci in house and he's like no 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 hasbro didn't have those anymore they didn't have the originals and they didn't have great source material so Doug Hart was tasked with recreating all four of those illustrations for the 1994 re-releases. So when I first started talking with Justin about this, I was like, hey, Justin, just, you know, you really want to be careful and check. Is this the original by Petrucci or is this the recreation by Hart? Good point. So, so I reached out to Hart and I said, Doug, can you confirm if this is the original G.I. Joe Action Sailor by Sam Petrucci or if it's your 1994 recreation? And he said, it's the original. If you look at the edge of the board, it's yellowed with age. So there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, Doug Hart is saying this is not the one he created in 1994. This is the original from 1964. So this is a huge piece, Justin. Oh, yeah. I, it, I can't imagine. It, when you see it in person, it, it the age is all over. You know, it's, yeah. it's beautiful, but you can see the age. And you can even, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the extension of the top. It's it's much much longer than it would sure. have needed to be. Mm -hmm. um, actually, originally it was in a frame when we received it, so uh, you can see that it got some discoloration over time from being in that frame. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know the, it, the it's all the other markers that I see from the board and the edges and the, everything is in the textures and everything is consistent with the age of when this would have you know would have been from. So uh, this. You know, again, a very cool piece to have held in my hands. Oh, and, I bet. You know, this is as historical as you get from the yep. the very beginning. 
Yeah. Um, and as we know, this this is not how the figure came in the box, which oh, no. is also a very interesting part of this, you know, this particular piece is that, you know, they did make a Frogman, but in the box, it was not this figure at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I can only imagine getting this as a child and going, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, it's a little false advertising, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? This is <laughs> very cool, but this is not what I signed up for. Yeah. yeah that, was called, that, was, that was another form of diabolical marketing because <laughs> what you did is you, you bought, you, your mom bought you this and it was nothing more than the action sailor in, a, in, in like, you know, a basic... Uh, uh, dung, you know, de uh, denim shirt and dungaree pants. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, what you had to do was convince mom to go right one foot over and buy for five dollars. <laughs> if you bought the figure for a buck ninety nine, you went over two feet and bought the frogman suit for four ninety nine. Mm. So that that's how you you know that's how you had to get you know get it was it was. It was Barbie on steroids, the way Barbie's <laughs> they marketing on steroids. What do they call that? The razor model where like Ra the razor, razor itself razor doesn't blade. cost, but razor, the blade razor, is what blade. costs. Yeah. 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 It's an actual um, marketing term. Yeah. They got, they got the kids with this one. That that's definitely some false advertising on the front of the box there. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, man. It, it, this is, I, I can't imagine. Yeah. That's a fantastic piece. I can't imagine market value on that. Um, yeah. That's, that's well, that, well, that's you know one of the things that one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is this, you know, I, I'm fortunate to have held these. I'm for, Heritage is fortunate to be, you know, to, to be presenting these. But from a historical, so these don't. If anything like this ever trades hands, it happens privately, like you know, yeah. with Garrido artwork, it, it almost never comes up publicly for uh, for you know a, the, the average person who yep. has the means to get something like this. So, uh, you know, having this much artwork come up at one time, um, you know, especially of this caliber, I, there is no benchmark for what this is, you know, worth in the open market because it simply hasn't been in the open market before. Well, we, I could, you know, I'm sure I could sit here and talk to you for many more hours, but, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think we're at a good spot where we can, uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've ended on a real high note here. So I want to take the time to, uh, again, appreciate you both coming on here. I think it, it, it's been Anytime. fun for me to discuss this. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is a great opportunity. So I uh, want to remind everybody, we have the Windy City Collection coming up on November 20th. Um, will be the final day of the uh, live auction. Bidding will start next week online. If you're interested, go to ha.com slash 7389. Um, again, Kirk Bazigian, Kasim Metaxas, thank you very much, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Very Always good. a thank pleasure. You. Take care, guys. Always good to Yo, see you, Joe. Kirk. Yo, right, Joe. Carson. Take care, buddy. <laughs>